How are you? Hi, I'm I'm doing well considering. <laughs> How's your pandemic? How's my pandemic? Um, personally, pretty uneventful. Uh, existentially cha uh, chaotic and uh, anxiety-inducing. But you know, who can't relate to that? <laughs> yeah, any 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 good days? Yeah, I mean, there's good days. It's weird because it's almost like. I'm trying to figure out how to, this phrase might be a little trite, but like to sit in gratitude and be comfortable with joy because there are so many things in my life, you know, I'm immensely privileged and, you know, my, fortunately my family is healthy and my friends are okay. I have a place to live and have been able to support myself. So it's, uh, it's a constant practice trying to remind myself to <laughs> wake up and show up for my life um, in the present and and just be thankful about it instead of constantly meditating on all of the the macro level bad things that are happening like in the wor the world writ large um, yeah it's it's a uh, it's it's good to try and remember that it's an and is what i always try to remind myself you know it's an and yeah. and not a but if that yeah. makes sense, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, totally. I, and, you know, that's something I've been thinking about so, so much recently is trying to get away from forced duality or, like, this imagined dichotomy of good and bad or, like, this or that. It's, you know, not either or. It's both and. <laughs> um, man, I'm just full of little aphorisms today. <laughs> well, I'm planning on packaging most of this for a greeting card, so I think it's going to work out. <laughs> awesome. It's going to work out well for me. It's a really lovely record, Julian. Thank you. I, I genuinely appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you like it. I really did. I want to talk a little bit about it. You went back to school? Yeah, I sure did. Um, I went back to Middle Tennessee State in the end of 2019 and just finished up my degree. So now I have a, a pretty vague degree in English liberal arts. Uh, <laughs> what made you want to? What made you? Of course. What made you want to? Um, what made, I mean, you, 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 most people get degrees in order to gain work and and and, and live their lives. And and the music was doing really well. And and you know you had a career. Why the decision to go back? Well, you know we. I always say we because I'm so used to discussing my music, even though it's just me and it's just my namesake. It's like um, I think of it so much more as this thing that I was doing with a touring party or like this thing I was doing with Camille, who plays violin or with um, or with Aisha. But uh, I <laughs> stopped touring in the middle of 2019. I mean, I wish I could say it was all fully my decision, but I I knew that it was getting to be too much and I wasn't in a super healthy place. And the people around me were also aware of that. Wow. <laughs> and so I, you know, I was looking at months and months of what I was thinking was going to be tours that were now canceled and I knew that if I didn't create some sort of structure for myself or do something task oriented that I would just have all the more time to languish in sadness. <laughs> so I tried, um, I registered late. I like missed the whole registration. I just emailed an advisor and I was like, is there still time? And, um, yeah, they were gracious enough to let me come back to school there. And I don't know, you say, it's funny that you say usually people get a degree to pursue a, a certain profession that they're trying to become educated or more skilled in. Uh, and I, I do love learning. <laughs> and it was like a personal point of pride for me that I wanted to finish this degree because I had dropped out with only like one semester left and it just felt kind of like you know, something I would like to make good on. But I also, if I'm being completely honest, it's like, you know, I was 
entertaining all of these ideas like maybe music isn't the thing that I do for a living forever. Really? After, which is hard because it's, it's like I had been touring pretty constantly for years and things were going well. Uh, you know, I had achieved the things that I imagined that I wanted when I was a kid. Mm. I was able to play music as my livelihood, as my profession. Um, but then I found after taking some time away from music that maybe, I don't know, I, I think it's a very odd impulse that a lot of people have that they have to make the thing that they're passionate about yeah. their job yeah. totally yeah like i don't know why and this is true even of like i didn't go to school originally for english i went to school originally to do audio engineering and the reason why i chose to do audio engineering instead of songwriting or visual art or something is because I had it in my mind that I needed to have a marketable skill, yeah. you know, like yeah. everything is so bootstrappy and capitalist and that's super obvious to point out, but it is true. It influences how people imagine their lives and imagine their futures. And when I went back to school, it was because, you know, I, I wasn't touring anymore and I didn't know if that was ever going to be something that I could do again. I didn't know if people were going to hear a record that I made that was really different from the last one and totally hate it. And I think, but there was some kind of solace in knowing that I didn't have to collapse my identity w as a human being with my identity as a performer to still love music, you know, if that makes sense at all. It, it does. I mean, it means that you can, you are I, I will I now I feel a little uncomfortable by the intro where I talked about um the two Julian Bakers, you know. There's a Julian Baker in a dorm room and the Julian Baker on her on stage. But I get how you can feel that way. And I, I get that this no. can remind you that hey, I'm 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 just one, you know? Yeah. No, seriously, and I, I think also probably the nature of how I was performing exaggerated all of those things because I was Spray and Inkle got signed to 6131 Records and I put that album out in the midst of trying to get my band signed and trying to get me and all my friends, like people to listen to the music that I was making with my friends that was full band. And so it's like I achieved, achieved, or was given or came by some success, like um, a modicum of success not quite how i had imagined it you know it's almost it's very like greek mythology it's when you get what you wished for but it's not quite what you wished for yeah the dog um, who caught the car yeah <laughs> there you go um yeah it's it, it was one of those situations and i mean i can't say that i'm not thankful or proud or happy for all of the experiences that i got to have but yeah it is really different to go from existing in essentially a family context with a band and touring with that band and performing with that band and having musical chemistry on stage to just singing alone with nobody maybe you know a violin accompanist on a couple of songs and it's just like I didn't realize how much that isolation played into how I imagined myself as a performer. And, you know, maybe I realized when I went back to school and I thought, you know, maybe maybe I don't tour anymore. Maybe that's not a viable thing for me to do. Maybe I just go back to school and get my degree and then I just try to find a job to support myself and still play music. Like, that was a really freeing thought yeah. for me to come to a place where it was a serious prospect to not do music as my job and there was never a moment where I thought that I would not play guitar that afternoon you know what I mean like yeah it helped separate um 
my identity as a musician from my identity as a performer. And now, I don't know, it might be hard to go. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm going back on the road whenever that is yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a band, with a band of people I've known for decades. Um, I think th- that will be a really healthy transition, like not just sonically, but I don't know, emotionally. Yeah, I, 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 I want to talk about it sort of creatively. Can we, can we just play, yeah. a, play, play a song, take a listen to this? That's Julian Baker with Hardline off her new record, Little Oblivion. It's Julian Baker's my guest. So we were just talking about all the different sort of emotionally um, existential changes that happen when you sure. go back to school after, you know, a, a, some success, a, a quite significant success as, a, as an artist. And you were you, you were kind enough to, you know, to or gracious enough to let us know that, you know, you weren't are, are sure whether you were ever going to continue doing music. And then you were talking about all the sort of revelations and epiphanies you had while taking time off. Did that change what you wrote about when you were writing this record in school? Oh, man. It's it's hard to say because this record came together really gradually. So there's almost... It's just like a document of me learning these things. Um, it felt like just cataloging the shifts in perspective but also like the pain that comes with those because it's it's never just about changing your mind from one way of thinking to another there's also sort of this shame in being wrong sometimes or even like a mourning like having to mourn the fact that you had an idea of what things were like and that turned out not to be true right it's, yeah, it can be um, it can be earth shattering in some ways yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, and it's easy, I think people correctly glean from my music that that has almost always taken place in the arena of faith for me, yeah. but also the, just everything, <laughs> you know, everything about how you imagine yourself in the world. Um, right, I understand that. I think a lot of people, yeah. my, maybe myself included, as we get older and, and as we learn more and we start to question ourselves and question our faith, and you, you often became, um, I don't want to say a symbol, but you often became like a something to listen to, to hear. You're right, we would hear your music and through the lens of someone perhaps negotiating faith. I understand that. Yeah, sure. I, and I mean, it's it's interesting too, like, I don't know, this record was made in a much less immediate fashion right i I had not only more time to sit on the songs and tinker with their production and with their arrangement and the filters and plugins and stuff um but i also had more time to sit and think about if i truly meant something in a song or if i found it salient to say and I think in the past especially with my solo music but like both of my previous records have been really intense emotions uh, and ideologies that I just vomited out because I had to you know I mean like that's always been the process of music it's it's a way to express a feeling that needs to be articulated and can't Mm -hmm. be through words so Mm -hmm. I use music but Mm -hmm. um yeah I don't know I think I everything felt so urgent because the feelings were so big that I didn't ever take a really long time to sit on the songs and think about them and about not just their lyrical content but like how things are phrased and with this record yeah I don't know it was it was a slower process that involved a lot of self-reflecting, but I think ultimately it made me 
more confident about the record. You know, like I feel like I had time to analyze it myself instead of looking back three years later down the road and just then figuring out what I was getting at in a record, you know. I, I want to play another song. Take take a listen. Day one chip on your dresser, get loaded at your house. I ask if you remember you say I don't know what you're talking about. Swallow the truth, force the charcoal down my throat. Finally come to maybe I'll have something to show. It's the first day of the new year. I'm Tom Perry listening to Q. Jillian Baker is here. That's the song Crying Wolf from her new album, Little Oblivion. Jillian, tell me, uh, tell me about that song. Well, um, it's funny because I was just, I was doing like an interview with a French publication and having to like explain the idiom of crying wolf. <laughs> and so I was about to be like, well, there's this story about a young boy. <laughs> Listen, I know we're Canadian. I know we're Canadian. Today, but we, we got it up You're here not... too. We got the wolf up here too. Yeah. I mean, you know, okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, you know, I just make sure I got it. It's a polar bear up here, but we get it. This don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So basically, I don't know. This is a, uh, Maybe this is dark, but it's also humorous. And I, you know, maybe I'm a sick individual, but I find that those things are often the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to explore that trope in a song, or rather, like, was inspired to explore that trope in a song because there's a bar here in Nashville called Crying Wolf um, that. I would frequent in in my like really dark <laughs> um s- like self-pitying wallowing phase. We all have that phase. Mm-hmm. Um but uh basically I was just thinking about like hmm the relationship between a person who needs help and their willingness to ask for it from their friends like um because in that fable or parable or whatever, um, the young kid is crying out about an imagined threat or a, a made-up fictionalized threat. And, you know, his parents come time and time again to figure out that it's not true, that there was no threat. And then eventually he runs into a real wolf, gets eaten because nobody believes him. Um, and I found myself in a similar situation except for that I don't know imagine if that little kid went out every day and looked around for wolves and then was surprised when the wolves hurt him like that's what I kind of felt like I was doing that's what's what's the wolf for you uh I don't know maybe you know Drugs and alcohol are the easiest ones to point to, but also any number of self-destructive behaviors. Just, you know, I felt like in the wake of having my my ideas of how the world was organized and what was important to me and uh, what I believed turned upside down, I went through... As many people do, I'm sure I went through a phase of a really like nihilist rejection of everything because, you know, it's like you spend so long with uh, very specific convictions or beliefs. And then when you realize that those things are more fallible or less, uh, (laughs) less certain than you think they are, then it makes you obviously question every other conviction that you hold and how real that can ever be. So at this point in my life, I just felt like, why? Like, why try to stay away from things that are considered bad if I now don't even know if I have the same idea of what constitutes good and bad? Um, But just like everything, it's like that's a very escapist mentality (laughs) to have um but yeah 
I don't know. I just, I found myself in a situation where I was like intentionally seeking out destructive situations. And then like my friends were offering to help me. Like here I am with this real wolf. I'm really in trouble. Um, and I do actually need help. But how many times would you rescue that kid from a wolf if every day they just woke up and went straight back to went the back, wolf did? Went back to the wolf. I, I got to say, yeah. you were you were on my mind when I, and I saw you talk about this in another interview, but you were on my mind anyway. I don't know if you remember this. We talked uh, yes. about four years ago. Yeah. So you you had a place in my in my in my mind and i read that gq article that you talk about a bit the one with you and jason isbell and steven tyler and, and ben harper and trey anastasio and some others talking about getting sober and being sober and i had talked to jason too and he had said something to me along the lines of like tom by you never know how your sobriety changes when everybody knows about it he said, like, I feel like I can't mess up because everybody is relying on me, you know? And my God, Julian, I thought about you when I read that article, you know, that there's an, there's an implicit pressure through people like me, you know, through talking about yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I admire Jason so much. The coolest dude. Um Big fan. <laughs> Big fan of Jason Isbell, the musician and the person. But um, that's exactly right. Like, And I think that's important to talk about as an artist because, I mean, there's just so many levels <laughs> to that. Like, I didn't want to make my sobriety... I didn't want to make it like the sole defining element of my personality, but inevitably when you are a person who exists to whatever degree in the public realm, the say like the most salient things about you get distilled down to like pull quotes, like being sober, being queer, being Christian, whatever that means. Um, and <sighs> Jeez, yeah. I mean, I think it's funny that you bring up that specific article. That article was just like a cosmic ego killer because I remember doing the interview and they were like, oh, it's going to come out in a couple of months and I was sober. And when the interview came out, I had, I was like struggling with substance abuse again at that time. Jesus. And I was like, <laughs> I remember reading it <laughs> and just like... I don't know, it was devastating because I wow. felt, well, I mean, it was devastating for many reasons. And it's like, this is again, this is a kind of negative cyclical thinking that happens often in like relapse situations. But I remember reading that and thinking like, well, now, now I have shattered the image of who I was telling everybody I was. Like I had this crippling imposter syndrome and the prospect of talking about not being sober was so terrifying and disappointing that I think that ended up manifesting as the kind of self-loathing that I was attempting to kill with substances. So it was like, it was like this compounding feeling of failure and escape. Yeah. But like, I don't know, I think... I'm not sorry that I for so long spoke openly about my sobriety and I'm I, I'm not sorry about it now because I think it was humbling. Like I I had been so removed from the self. Like I did almost think of myself as two people, as yeah. old Julian who was like a bad kid, yeah. smoking cigarettes and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> and um but that was an image of myself, and I have to remind myself all, uh, uh, of this all the time. That person was a child. Yeah. You know? And, like, I had this image of myself as a really bad person who was then, through my own mental, like, through my will and my adherence and my to stru structure and my faith was, like, 
redeemed and now I could be a good person. And so when I lost this idol of sobriety that I had been building up for so long, I had to re-examine all the pieces of my life and think like, am I still a good person? Was being sober what made me a worthy individual? Was that what gave me value as a human? And I think it's really important that I learned no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that I learned that it wasn't the principles that I lived by that made me a person worthy of love. It's just the fact that I'm a human being. <laughs> and like that, you know, you need that. You need that kind of mercy to successfully continue in the cycle of recovery, you know? Well, it reminded me, it reminds me of a line, and I'm going to get killed if I talk to you any longer, but it reminds me no, of sorry. a line. Oh, that's okay. It's my fault. It, it, it reminds me of a line in, in Relative Fiction on the same record where you say, I got no business praying. I'm finished being good. Now I can finally be okay and not the way I thought I should. So answer me this. Maybe this is a good good way to close off. What do you hope? What do you hope your life is like four years from now when maybe we get a chance to talk again? Ooh. I hope I'm still learning. I hope I'm getting more patient with myself. I hope I'm getting more patient with others. Um, I hope that I'm still learning how to do the right thing not because the right thing is what makes me feel good or what somebody else from an institution tells me but because it's the caring thing to do um i don't know i hope those principles still govern my life but that i continue refining them and i hope Maybe I have a master's degree. <laughs> I was just about to say, you know what I was just about to say? I was just what? about to say, I guarantee you now in four years, my opening question again is going to be like, so here you went back and did a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's my dream to be Dr. Julian Baker. Oh, I like th that, I, I think I'll put in the work just for the vanity of being able to call myself Dr. Julian Baker. If you want me to, I can call you Dr. Julian Baker as I'm about to extra this interview. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, actually. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Julian Baker was my guest. Her new album is called Little Oblivions, and it's out everywhere on February 26th. Lovely to talk to you, Julian. Thanks for your time. Of course. Lovely to talk to you, too, Tom.